You had ignored us for the final time, mortal. No more could we tolerate your insolence. Gaia sent a mighty ripple through the earth, and Nemesis screamed in rage, shaking the foundations of your precious city. No! No! The chalice! It can no longer contain the evil you have wrought. Even gods and goddesses don't know what will happen now. May they have mercy on you. there. I'm Geronimo, and welcome back to Greg Tech New Horizons. When we left off last time, we had just added two new buildings to give us some room to expand into the future. And now that we're back, it seems we have something new adding some scenery. Nice! Thanks to a bad YouTube channel 6037 for suggesting this build. I know it took a while, but I hope it was worth the wait. If you have any ideas yourself, leave them in the comments. And leave a like if you love this new addition to the story. Now that we have plenty of fuel capacity with the hog system and plenty of space, it's time to automate. The scale of what's coming is gigantic, and as much as I've enjoyed all the handcrafting, I put off installing a real AE auto crafting system for a bit too long. On the plus side, since we're in IV and have plenty of even the newest materials, we can do this right. In the IV chapter, all the quests for the individual machines have mysteriously disappeared, but as usual, a little exploring in the quest book reveals the reason. At this point, we have access to the next tier of GT++ multi-blocks to replace the single blocks, and for most of them, we need the equivalent IV single block machine as part of the craft the IV cutting machine for the multi-block cutting machine, the IV extruder for the multi-block extruder, etc. There must be a reason the ancient tome is pointing in this direction, so we should probably listen. Plus, there are a few advantages to the multi-blocks. One is that all the different recipes we use to craft in all of our machines rely on a circuit configuration to know what to make with the ingredients. If we use single blocks, we need at least one machine for every different circuit used in a craft for that machine. So something like 12 mixers, just as one example. With multi-blocks, you can assign a different circuit to each input bus, so instead of 12 machines, we just need 12 input buses. Another, bigger advantage is batch crafting. Instead of crafting just one item at a time, multi-blocks can do more than one recipe at a time depending on the relationship between required tier and available tier. For items we need a lot of, like plates, that's going to be extremely useful. As usual, there are a few kickers. First, to run a network with enough channels to allow for interfaces on all those different input buses, we need a much larger controller and a more sophisticated approach to handling our P2P subnetwork. Second, and stop me if you've heard this one before, we're out of circuits, and these machines take the best stuff we've got. We've got one last handcrafted batch of circuits to go. And lastly, these GT++ multi-blocks require some alloys we haven't made yet, and some we can't make yet. For one, and definitely not the only one, Stabiloy needs Uranium-238. The last time that came up, Thorium through a chemical bath gave us just enough to scrap through and make radon. This time though, we don't just need a little bit. We need a lot of it. In total, we want the wire factory, extrusion machine, material press, cutting machine, alloy blast smelter, processing factory, processing array, industrial mixer, and a large chemical reactor. That's going to take some serious alloy. Before that, let's quickly solve a little problem that's been plaguing the progress. With our three blast furnaces running at IV, we're burning cetane boosted diesel at an alarming rate. We can't do much with our current AE system, but we can add our high octane gasoline and start moving it where we need to. Let's get that done. There we go. Something tells me we're going to be running these a lot. And by that I mean basically every alloy we need requires these. Now, back to the uranium. To get this in large quantities, we need to expand our planetary reach. With the tungsten bee churning out combs, the Mars trip hasn't been a priority. But now things have changed. It's time for progress.
Here we go. The thermal suit has been achieved. Now time for the tier two rocket. Ah, look at it. Isn't it beautiful? We need to make a couple of stops. One on Mars for Dash for later, and one on Phobos for Uranium. Before we go, let's make some better oxygen tanks and some multi-block miners for maximum gains. I think we're all set for liftoff. A mining rig, a setup for drilling fluid, oxygen, and a fuel supply. Let's do it. So we've got everything we need, but we also picked up a new friend. Meet Denny, our living tribute to Volans, who not only gave his name, but is also an absolute gigachad without whom this world and series would have tremendous difficulty proceeding. Everyone say thanks to Volans in the comments if you'd be so kind. As for us, Denny, it's time to feast. Yes, you're enormous now, Denny. You can dominate your home planet. Perhaps one day you will. Now we have all the things, and we need to make some alloys. We need a little bit of everything, requiring a little bit of everything. Multiple varieties of Inconel, Stabiloy, Tantaloy, Talonite, Blue Steel, Black Steel, Miraging Steel, and more. <laughs> to get the last ones, we need the Alloy Blast Melter, one of the multi-blocks from the list. I think I hear the sweet sound of progress. Okay, pit stop here. We've got the ABS set up and we're working on the final alloys for the final multi-block. 
and we've got a kink in the plan. The large processing factory is a crazy expensive block, and the gnarliest item we need is this crafting table, which requires a couple of alloys from an IV alloy blast smelter. One of the quirks of that particular multi-block is that it can only take one energy hatch, so that means we need the IV energy hatch, which requires a bunch of IV machines in the clean room. If they're single block machines, that is. Ah yes, another benefit of multi-blocks. No more clean room. And it's just our luck that we already have all the ones we need. And unlike the ABS, they can all take multiple energy hatches, which is good, because we need all of them running at IV for these last alloys. We also need a couple more resources for the IV energy hatch that we don't have yet. Iridium and Indium. Normally, you'd have to do the entire plat line to get Iridium, but we're getting the comb as a secondary output from the Platinum B, and we've been saving Galena and Sphalerite for Indium for this exact moment for ages. Finally, producing Iridium also unlocks something else, the Vajra. Now this is a worthwhile detour. All right, we've got the IV energy hatch here, and for the moment, we'll have to transform up to IV. We've also got a few other multi-blocks set up running at IV on two EV energy hatches, all in temporary spots. So until we get everything relocated, we'll just share the combustion generators and use the machines one at a time. All we really need now that we have the hatch is the ABS anyway. The last remaining hurdle for the processing factory is Thorium-232, which is definitely one to trip over. It's got a short processing line, which we may automate at a later date, but for now, we're going to embrace the batch life one final time. It's time for progress. Here we go. Our first run of the ABS at IV, making Arcanite. We've got a few more alloys to make too, but we're close to the mountaintop at last. And then it and all, very nice. And with one last IV machine, the fluid solidifier, which we would need the large processing factory to use as a multi-block unfortunately, we can make the plates. And with the knit and all plates, we can finally make the project table, which means at last, we have the last piece of the puzzle, the large processing factory. That only leaves one thing, the Vajra, the ultimate tool for absolute power. We'll add an EV wireless charger for this guy too. It's expensive, but worth it. Indeed, a cause for celebration. Now we have all of our machines, and at least to start on a new applied energistics network. Controllers, interfaces, P2Ps, and crucially, the fluid crafting terminal. Since so many crafts require both items and fluid, we use a couple of approaches to handle that. For cases like the cutting machine and the circuit assembler, Buffering fluid in the input hatches works great because it's rare those machines need different fluids. But for the assemblers, extractors, and solidifiers of the world that use all sorts of fluid, we need to use fluid crafting recipes that send just the right amount of fluid to the machine. It's a certainty that we'll need more stuff, but no time like the present to get started. To begin, we have two ME controllers beside each other. One to provide channels to our main network, and one to provide channels to the subnetwork that we'll be using to move channels around. We're going to cover this large controller with P2Ps, so many, it will take a dense cable to get them all connected with enough channels. If we connect all the P2Ps, connect wiring to the dense cable, and connect the dense cable to the smaller controller, that will leave five sides of the controller that we can use to route the subnetwork. 
The problem we're solving with this setup is that with 20 P2Ps on this controller, we've used more than half the channels a dense cable can carry, which means that we can't even support a single output P2P for every input P2P we have here, even if we ran a dense cable all the way to the endpoints. Each side to a controller block can support 32 channels, just like a dense cable. So by consolidating the subnetwork into this single controller block, we get five more sides of 32 channels we can use for output. Now, if I can just figure out how to neatly arrange this cable. All right, we're all set with a new network controller, and the first things on the network are our terminals and drives. So let's load them up and get our storage system back. Ah, magnificent. Our main terminal location will be in here too. We'll probably move these drives at some point. We'll need more very soon. And here's where the controller design ended up. We managed to fit all 20 P2Ps and the wire to connect them and stay pretty neat about it. This should do the trick for now, and it was really good to get familiar with this subnetwork design before we scale up to a massive controller in the future. The Grandmaster Energy Absorber is going to give us some runway, but not quite enough for that just yet. If we drop down with dense cable from each side of the controller, we can branch off the dense cable in each of the cardinal directions and send the main network channels all the way to the buildings underground. There's still a little bit of legwork to do before we can put all these multi-block machines for an autocrafting setup too. Mainly that we need fluids for all the crafting. Everything needs to be reworked eventually, but for now, we'll just connect our existing setups for polyethylene, sulfuric acid, and some other bits we'll need for circuits and machine frames, and make huge batches of anything we're missing, with tags for automation, once we can simply request machines. Alright, everything's connected up, even all of our combs. And the first thing we needed from those is lubricant. Crazy, I know. But with all that done, it's time at last. We enter a new era. The era of true automation. Are you ready for progress?
That was a mission, but we made it. There were two priorities to get on autocrafting, machine parts and circuits, and both goals are complete. The only limitation now is resources, but all it takes to fix that is setting up the machines for comb processing on autocrafting next. There is one resource that bees can't help with though, and we need a lot of it, tantalum. This Thomcraft setup is for duplicating tantalum nuggets at the cost of some Essentia. It's been super handy, thanks again, Volants. But in order to meet our future tantalum needs, we need a better supply of Essentia. I think it's time we revisit the Dark Arts, but this time, instead of hiding away in the old basement, we need some room to grow. I've got some ideas, but I think we'll wait for next time for that. And hey, stay positive out there.